kind of a preamble today. Uh, we've got claims against each of the topics, so we're, we're going to try and live by that. And uh, Mike's going to make sure we stay on that. Yes. So you Thank can you. tell Fox shut up. Until somebody tells me to not do that. Until somebody, <laughs> yeah, until somebody tells, yeah, I was going to say somebody else is. One of these things. Yeah. <laughs> I got the hook right here. <laughs> you have the kicking authority today, uh, yeah. Arthur. Richardson. All right. Well, um, we, Patty reminded me we did not officially approve the minutes from the October 3rd meeting. So we need to do that first. And then we need to do the minutes from the October 17th meeting. And then we can go on into everything else. I move that we approve the minutes from the October 3rd and 17th meeting together. Okay. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mayor, Catherine? Yep. Aye. Okay. And I think uh, Marla is not on today. I, I got a kind of email for her that she will not be able to attend. Okay. Okay, so we've got a, a quorum and we've got a consensus. I think uh, uh, Bob is on his way, but he may be late, so yeah. I won't fill him for him until he gets here. I, I talked to him. Yes, Look at some property. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, real quickly, we'll go through the previous action items. Uh, Amendment one was approved on the 18th, um, so that is complete. Uh, we've got NTP and uh, we've got all the sub agreements are out, so we'll be working through that um, and we'll take that off for the next meeting. Uh, the biological opinion, uh, WSD did reach out to Dennis uh, right with ODOT. Uh, they have met with the QC folks from uh, NIMPS, and it seems like they're on track. Uh, they said it was a very positive meeting. Um, one somewhat concerning is that they, they do still have a huge workload. Um, the Abernathy Bridge, which is currently under construction, uh, has an ESA issue that is taking some attention, uh, but they did not give any indication that it was going to delay our uh, BO, but just that they were, you know, very busy with, with a lot of things going on, but uh, they are still working on and progressing our BO. So uh, we will continue every couple weeks checking in and, and making sure that that's moving forward. So. Maybe I'm wrong, oh, ma'am, but I thought the target was for them to approve it by the end of the year. I see this as the end of January. Has it slipped? It shouldn't be the end of January. I was meaning just January 1st, meaning the end of the year. We would have approval and it would be ready in January. Okay, so so originally it was January 1? That's what I was putting in as end of the year was okay, January so what, 1. What I'd like to do is, if, if you all agree, I like to start stacking the dates. Okay. So if our original date was January one, put it at the top uh, or or at the bottom. We need to make a convention. The latest one could be at the top. Uh, okay. Just so we see how many times this thing's changing. Yep. Okay. Good. We'll do that. Um. So the draft. So we're we're in progress of tracking that. The final we'll we'll keep on here as we progress through with the the draft. Um, the recommendation on the approach for appointees is still under some discussion. Um, we we will move that date out to the 14th. Yeah, the Oregon side, we hope to have it resolved by the next meeting. Okay. And, uh, it's not going to stop anything. And I don't know where you guys are in Washington. So. Um, and where we're just to summarize where we left at last meeting was that the commission formation agreements will basically push the decision out to the counties. The counties will then be responsible for setting up the process. Um, so once the counties have that set up, then we can finalize the lane the moving forward. But the CFA is basically just going to say the counties will set the process up. So. If I could just jump in on that. And then uh, for council. Uh, wants to give their opinion to the court commission on the CFAs uh, on the 15th of November, uh, just so that you know, they can do their legal writing to the court commission. Right. Okay. And so, will those need to be? Those will be finalized prior to the CFA being 
finalized? They would not have to be finalized prior to the CFA unless you wanted to finalize them prior to the CFA. Again, are we talking nomination process or are we talking the other? The nomination process. Yeah, I don't think it, I think you, you can separate them. Okay. Yep. And they can be so that we can move forward with the CFA. Basically, like I said, they, it basically just says that the counties will finalize the process and how they want to do it. And it that can be done. Okay. In July. Okay. So, um, Commissioner Anderson, can I ask a question? Um, how are we doing on Click Attack County? Do you guys have the what you need for that process to be implemented? So right now, I, I believe the uh, prosecuting attorney is still reviewing all the, the last recent one that's put out. And in terms of, you know, we had the discussion last meeting on um, the city's putting forward a name and then us taking that name. And so when we get up to actually writing that plan, we have till July. So we have to so, well, do we, be appointed by right. July. But do, do we, because and, and, and maybe I, read the draft CFA incorrectly. But what I thought was that the counties were gonna name uh, the, the members of the, of the new bridge authority. And that would happen early in the year, January, February timeframe. The Bi-State Working Group would continue running the show with the court until it comes into effect July 1. The idea was, the new bike state bridge authority people would be shadowing us for a few months before they take over. That's that's I think the way I remember reading it, but I may be totally wrong. Yeah, that's the way I remember it too. Okay. But is that actually does the CFA actually have those dates wired into yeah, it? Yeah, I think it does. Well, it has the July one day. It has July one, one day. It doesn't have the transition. It doesn't have the specifics of the process, as an example. Yeah, no, if I remember right, it says that up front, there will be a transition period, right. which I assume would be shadowing of the, of the bike state. Right. Which was approximately six months. I mean, that, that yeah, transition time they, was about six months. But that means we got to we gotta finish this thing up so that, you know, the, the two counties have time to make nominations and selections if they're going to have it in place in January. And the cities have time to get the recommendation to the county. So all those just back all that time out. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's quite lengthy. You got your new appointments coming on January sometime. Usually we appoint in the, like maybe by the second meeting in January, usually. Right. I mean, it's kind of. All right, same, same for the county. We have one meeting in January and that's when we would uh, be making uh, most appointments, but we can do them in any meeting. It's not required. Uh, usually we'll, we review kind of, we, we do load balancing, right? Since some people wind up with all the committees and then you have, we have three new members out of five. So we're gonna have to rebalance everything. But we can just keep, it's also, we know that it's coming along. We'll just keep it in, we'll, we'll, I'm not gonna let them forget it. So the one thing that I would kind of throw out here for you, does the Bi-State Working Group want to come together with a recommendation for the two counties of the types of qualifications to come onto this, this, uh, this. So you've already prepared something, right? Yeah, that's great. Well, yeah, but that was more of a nomination. No, but you, but in, within that is the qualification. There's some of I it in there. You know, having a job description, which is effectively what we've done, yeah. it's fantastic because it's hard to remember all the different elements of this job when you're talking to people. And people when you ask people, do you want to volunteer for this? They say, well, what do I do? Right. You're, you're, that's I think another explanation. If we want to use that as a starting point, fine, but that was just yeah. one person's opinion. Well, you can share with us and use yeah. it as a starting point. Yeah. Yeah, I think having like the duties, the expectations, the job description sounds fine, but saying this is what we expect to get because you're never going to keep No, it. no, no, no. But, and I don't know. Here's a recommendation of the types of qualification people with qualifications that you're not going to get one person with all of it. Right. But as you look around through the county, hopefully you can find one that can do this group and blend it together. We have a list of skills that we want the group as a whole to, to embody. Each and person that, doesn't have to have all of them. Otherwise, and I see that more at the base level, not at the county expecting to, you don't want the county commissioner deciding. Well, we see that there's a hole here. We want to cut. Yes, you can, but you need both sides talking. I mean, the communication is going to be through us, right? right. 
So I'm certainly going to bring back and say, hey, um, you know, as we look for somebody, I think they're kind of weak on, you know, they, they, they need you know, someone with, uh, you know, bonding experience or whatever. Yeah. You know. But honestly, that's what we pay the big bucks to these guys for. <laughs> but someone who knows how to watch them. Right? <laughs> that's the point, right? It's oversight. It's oversight. Oversight means you have to have some, you know, you can't be a pushover. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Can I make a general request? Yes. Um, so in looking at the agenda today, it was just reminding me that um, the number one complaint I get about uh, public meetings it is is um, the uh, how that they're all in code. Uh, and we're talking in code here, BO, uh, uh, CFA. I'm sorry, I'll spell agenda, stuff out. The agenda, but even more so the agenda. So if a yeah. member of public picked up the agenda, it takes me a couple of minutes to decode it. Yeah. And um, so I would like to request that, um, uh, not for today, but in the future, that we have fewer acronyms and that we, uh, we had this discussion already. Well, I mean, it helps to minute take or two. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we will, we will cut down on the English. Yeah. I don't think uh, we're English. losing a lot of English. time by saying, uh, um, um, yeah. No, I have to remember what CFA stands for yeah, information, right. mission formation agreement. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. not too long. Yeah. Yeah. And no. That forces us to know what we're talking about. Yeah. Appreciate that comment. That's, yeah. Should have already done that. Okay. So you're into the, Discussion items. Yep. So the informational items uh, update on the DC trip uh, did reach out to Hal. Not a lot has changed. He is trying to get Martiza uh, for dinner, but he has not gotten a res uh, response yet for uh, the USDOT. Um, so, so the one thing I would be pushing Hal for is what do we want to do different this time than what we did last time, and and what should be our focus so we've got enough time to prepare slides and stuff if we want to do that a little package to take with us okay and especially with the dot and uh, with carrie i think is on on and the phone here i'd really like to to know what we're going to do with the do uh, the uh, uh dot um, the tiffia that's different than what we did last that's time and and i hope it's not just more of the same I, I think, Carrie, you were talking about doing some kind of a preliminary letter. Um, I don't know that we were talking about a letter. We're certainly going to our plan at this point. It, it certainly depends on their schedule. But our plan is in the next three weeks to have our first formal consultation with the Build America Bureau. And, you know, at that point, and I don't remember, you, you met with them before. We've met with them um, virtually since then. I think it would be nice to have something to leave behind with them when we go in. And, and I don't know that it needs to talk about money a whole lot, but I think, you know, the same type of thing that we were developing for the legislative days that really talks about the purpose and need, the, the preliminary funding picture, those kinds of things. Um, maybe some of the things we took out of the presentation to the legislators to let them know that we're thinking about money. And we will have already talked with Nefertiti and the technical staff at Build America Bureau about that. I presume you're gonna be meeting with maybe the higher up levels uh, and it would be good for you to be able to reference that that consultation. So we'll have you all prepared for that. Yeah, when we went out in July, we met with him and, and we basically gave him the whole speech as far as where is the project, how much money do we need, you know, all of the stuff that we've talked about already, he's already heard from us. So what I was kind of thinking, Carrie, and I want your opinion on it, shouldn't we, after your discussion with him, shouldn't we develop a simple timeline that says, here's our plan of attack to, to get funding in place, broad terms, funding in place, which is, you know, not only the states, but the uh, TEPIA loans and what we're doing with uh, and raising tolls and segregating uh, some of those tolls out for replacement bridge. But I would think we'd wanna sit down with him and his staff and say, hey, we heard you last time. We've kind of got our act together before, but we're, we're maturing that now. Here's a real plan that we're laid out as a little mini schedule of how we're gonna put this thing together. 
Otherwise, like that idea. What we're kind of talking about. That yes. When you, when you talk to Hal, did he say anything about when the other grant applications will be announced? He's been still not, here. Yeah, I have not heard any update on that. Carrie, you haven't heard any updates on the latest grants? No, I, I did hear that it would be after the elections, that nobody's going to do anything right now to distract from from elections. Um, so, but I would expect, um, you know, some of the bigger programs probably before the end of the year. Okay, so. so well, because I think there's going to be people who maybe are not staying in office, who want to be able to claim responsibility for things they've done and things like that. I think the the big infra grants that were announced earlier in the year were probably done far enough in advance of the elections that the people that were responsible for the, the politicians got to get credit for that in run up to the election. And then, you know, the second group will be people who maybe are getting run out of office who are going to want to take um, responsibility for it. But I, you know, the DOT, one thing I've learned is they certainly work on their own schedule. And you get the, the legislators usually get about a week's notice that their particular projects have been approved. Um, but it it is, other than that, you just don't know when it's gonna happen. And I don't know how they keep such good secrets in the DOT, but they seem to. I just think between now and maybe, maybe the next meeting, we ought to have some kind of working session for this December trip to, to figure out what is our message and what are we really trying to do here? We'll get that set up. Okay, um, CFA, we went through the only uh, additional update on that, the primary place of business, we are working on a questionnaire for that rather than a in person meeting. Um, and we'll, we'll circulate that questionnaire out when we get it to a draft format, uh, with the idea that we'll send that out both to the Washington and Oregon side um, to, to test the waters and see what kind of an in, a response we get. And then depending on what that response is, then we may take it to a in-person or a virtual meeting or something like that. But we wanted to kind of test the waters first uh, and see how much interest we get before we just jump into a public in-person meeting. So the question I would have there is, is how are we gonna get it out to, the, to a big population of people? If you just put it on the port website, yeah. you're gonna get very few people looking at it. Jess, do you wanna? We um, will be preparing a, a press release and reaching out to a bunch of our contacts to make sure that we're spreading the word. We also have developed a pretty extensive stakeholder list so far, um, but I was hoping that we might be able to potentially also get some support from some of our bi-state working group members to also send it out through your, your channels as well. Do we have a social media presence? Not yet. Not yet. It's pretty we short. do have the ability to post some social media through the ports um, accounts, and we have we posted a couple so far. Do we know what the span of that is? Does anyone look at that? I can't speak to the ports accounts at this point, um, but it, we are planning to create our own social media accounts for the bridge replacement project um, in November. So I'll, I'll be able to. Tell you more about those once we get those going. Let me ask um, a different question then. Uh, sure. In other projects that you've done uh, in areas where there's not really a media market, right. uh, have you been successful in using social media as an alternative to get the message out, or, or what have you absolutely. done in places? Okay. Yeah, so, absolutely. Like, what sort of places? Um, can you can you <laughs> describe a, a a place where you've had to use social media because there was no TV or yep. radio? Or, Sure. So um, I I do a lot of work out in La Pine, Oregon. Oh, that's and a good example. There's like really, there's a very small, basically the way that most people in La Pine find out about things is through their coupon magazine or through social media. And there's a bunch of um, Facebook groups that, you know, like we were able to, I ended up getting about, I think it was 600 responses to a survey in an online open house in the pine and it was primarily done through social media and um postcard mailings but i know that postcard mailings is also a little bit of a tricky thing um in the gorge and so we were also planning to just do some 
direct emails to stakeholders just to make sure that everybody was aware of this particular survey. Great, thanks. Uh, I have a pop. I have a suggestion. I don't know if this would work or we, if we could even do it, but um, could we put some kind of a sign on the bridge when people go through the tolls about this thing that's coming up? Maybe something they could take a picture of a, a QR code or a picture. You know, everybody's got their phone right there. Could we hand it out, hand it out a little postcard with a QR code that took them to the survey? Yeah, or, or we from the survey coming out as well, right, Carrie? We, we have the uh, the uh, optimization study that we are doing in conjunction with uh, the TNR work at the state level. They have asked for to send out two different survey cars on user preference. And so I think that's happening in November and maybe one in December. Is that right, Carrie? Yeah, one of those handouts is going to happen in, gosh, just in the next couple of weeks. And that is the stated preference survey, which is really for the general population of, of bridge users. And they're going to do a number of, of ways to get a hold of people. But one of them is um, in your toll plaza handing out uh, postcards to individual people. Now, what I don't think, Kevin, is they're going to be that, that willing to have us add on right. to that particular handout because that handout actually is going to have either a QR code or a link of some kind that is unique and establishes a, a, a unique response to the survey. Um, well, I'm not sure if it's, but we could talk, we could this talk This idea. I was just thinking those are the users. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. that's how you what target. About, is it possible to add it into the e-statements that all EasyPass users get emailed to them? Yeah, I think I think we can do that. I just know we've been very uh, sensitive about loading up our uh, those uh, breeze by customers with too much too much stuff, so that when we have something regarding the breeze by or the bridge tolls specifically, they pay attention. So yeah. I don't think we have to worry about that. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever opened that's, one of those. Okay. Well, that's, I think, maybe You've never read it and thought, yeah. now I know I'm going to unsubscribe. <laughs> I, will put a, I will put my bridge operator's hat on a little bit and say I'm a little concerned about um, a sign on the bridge or especially something mm -hmm. that you want somebody to take a picture of a QR code as they're driving. What you want people to do on your bridge with nine foot lanes is to drive and concentrate on that. Yeah, and not was, on trying to understand a message about what they're supposed to do and remember a web address or take a picture of a QR code. So I think, but but and the, the other problem with postcards is you're only going to get that postcard to the person, the, to the the few, to the small portion of your population that's stopping in the toll plaza to pay a cash toll. Yeah, and so we're going to have to be a little bit creative about how to how to target okay. this messaging. Let's let's make this a we'll talk through this and yep. figure out it, it won't be one source that we use for sure. So I think that's an option is to use that as one of the sources, but we'll we'll set it up to to be as broad as we can. Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll include um, we're preparing a, a draft survey right now um, for everyone to review and I can in that draft survey just include some outreach opportunities. And would love any additional feedback on what we come up with. The, the one thing I would offer us to think about is that this is the first communication with with our population. I know. And, and this is going to be the first of many. So we know, ought to be building a database of contacts. Mm -hmm. And I think I think you know going after the breeze by actually that's pretty easy we know what their emails are we could create something there but i'm just thinking you know as we build this first one let's think about the second third fourth and fifth yeah and one of the things we talked about too was maybe trying to get a little more information than just the place of business um and just you know adding three or four other questions that kind of funnel from a big level down to a smaller um, to gain just a little more than just, you know, simply asking them a single question and yeah, some of an education process of here's the bridge and why and, yeah. you know, okay. more. Well, we'll leave that with you guys. Okay. 
Um, grant status, we talked about uh, no real changes on any of that. We have not gotten any questions that I've seen. So hopefully they're in the process of making some decisions. Um, treaty MOAs, uh, the Yakima Treaty, uh, we got comments back from ODOT. We went through those and provided them uh, last week with an, uh, another version. Uh, so uh, Roy, who is their travel liaison, is in the process of reviewing that. Um, we're hoping that we'll hear back from him uh, in the next day or two. Uh, if we don't, we'll reach out to him again and, and see if we can sit down with him and just do a page turn with him on the, the Yakima Nation. Once that is ready to go, it will go with the 106 MOA uh, to FHWA to review. Once they review it, if they have no comments, then we will uh, then kind of open the door to the other tribes. Um, we had an initial conversation with Umatilla uh, and their new legal uh, staff, and they were very open to us uh, you know, bringing them into the MOA conversation. They recognizing it's going to be different and separate than the Yakima Nation, but they were you know, willing to start those conversations with us as soon as we were ready to send them a draft. So, um, so it's progressing, I think, and uh, hopefully within the next few weeks, we'll have something that can go to the Yakima Nation. So, but I would anticipate when we do send it to FHWA, it's probably a 30 day. They, that was what we were given was a 30 day with the hope that it would be shorter than a 30 day review period by the FHWA review staff. So. FHWA? Yes. That's right. Federal Highway. Federal Highway. Sorry, I will try not to do that. Just if you do not know, please call me out, and I okay. will. I will uh, try to remember not to abbreviate. So. And while you're at it, what was Roy's last name? Um, what? Well, yeah. Yep, Roy Waters is the tribal liaison. And then I read the report. The one I was a little concerned about is Warm Springs. So that's being handled totally by ODOT. For right now, yes. We are going to talk to Roy. Um, Akana has a member of the Warm Springs tribe that works for their company. Um, so I want to have some additional conversations with Roy about maybe trying to go through that channel um, to Warm Springs. But yeah, right now, Warm Springs has kind of said, we don't want to talk to you. We're only going to talk to the agencies. Uh, we're hoping if Yakima comes on and starts to gain some momentum and Umatilla does, that they will they will kind of follow on once they see others you know, participate and we think they'll come along. But I mean, it, it, they're all unique and it will take different times with each one of them. So that's the one thing we've, that's, con, that's consistent. Were they talking that they might uh, draft a letter for uh, the, the state administrator? Yes, the state administrator and ODOT were going to draft a letter to Warm Springs, kind of encouraging them to participate in the process. That way it's more of like a government to government discussion. So they are going to do that also. So um, we'll continue to push that from that angle too. Yes. I, I think it would be worthwhile for HNTV as you get more and more familiar with this is to give us a, a plan of attack for all four of them, put in a little mini schedule and says, here's where I'm targeting to try and have them to approve it. Okay. If, if we don't have that, we're just kind of running week to week to week to week and no perspective. This took this long. It's influencing this. I, I, I just don't like to run blind like that. No, and I think once we get to the the draft agreement, the very first draft agreement, that's really where that you'll be able to do that a little better um, is once we have that started, then we can we can formulate that a little better. It's because if this thing shows that it's going to push out until 2024, then I think we've got to go back hat in hand that says, hey, don't hold up the rod for this. You know, we continue to work with them. We're showing we're working with them. We've got to get going on design. Yeah. And one of one of the thoughts was that once we get the MOAs in, we get the 106 MOA to a point of signature, the BO to a point of signature, and we've started these draft, uh, you know, we have a, an agreement in the Yakima Nation's hands that at that point we go back to the feds and say, hey, you know, can we separate these? We've, we're have we right to the point of having signature. There's actually two examples now. Um, both the one, the previous example we had um, in Washington and the latest one we had from 2014 with the Puyallup. The Puyallup 
treaty agreement was done five years after the NEPA and ROD were signed. So it was signed in 09 and the, the treaty agreement was signed in 2014. So there is some precedent that they have done this and done it separately. So, but uh, I think the other piece is if the Bi State Bridge Commission and the CFAs are done, you know, say January, February timeframe, that is another leverage point that we could use to say, hey, you know, these can now be separated. We have an NC that's actually a, a organization that can be responsible and speak for itself. So those are all pieces that I think we continue to use to ask. Um, Section 106 Biop, we talked about um, RBMC update. The geotechs are putting their work plan together. We should have this that this week. Um, they are planning before the end of the year to be out doing the first two land borings on the Oregon side and then go over and do the Washington borings and then start on the in-water borings. The in-water are the ones that really require all the permits. Um, so that process has also started. We've already started submitting through uh, through the agencies to start updating and getting some of the permits in process. So you'll start seeing some of the geotech work uh, progressing. And then we're starting to pull together the preliminary engineering and start to get together the documents that will be needed to put together a RFQ, RFP, depending on the delivery method decision that we come out with in December. So next meeting, could we well, have, have a mini schedule yep. for the geotech? Yes. Okay. That's anticipated we'll have that okay. the next meeting. And the preliminary engineering one also, we should have that. Um, all right, so the meat of today was to get into the amendment to presentations that we uh, wanted to walk through with you. Um, so is Herb on? I did not see Herb. All right, we're going to skip that part. I'm not sure what Herb's not on. So, Carrie, we're going to start with you on the financing FFT. You're on mute. Sorry about that. You figure I would know how to do this after however many years, but I am going to go ahead and start my presentation, I hope. Well, let's see. This is either going to work or it's not, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and it appears, hold on. Okay, hold on here. I am going to share my screen. Share that screen. Tell me if you are seeing Yes. Yes. Got okay. It. So I don't want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna move through this pretty fast. There's a tremendous amount of de detail here, and I'm happy to to um, elaborate on any part of it. Um, but I'm not going to assume that you want me to elaborate on much or any of it. So you'll have to stop me and 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 let me know um, if you if you have some questions. So this is this is a description really focused on just the scope. What is it that that we feel needs to be done um, above and beyond what was in the original contract? And I will say the original um, contract was pretty light when it came to funding, financing, and tolling. And what we're discovering as we move along here is there's a whole lot of work to be done, and we're already doing a lot of it. Um, but we are going to need to expand the scope. Uh, and accordingly, the budget somewhat uh, as we move along. So just a, a very brief reminder of what is in the existing scope. Um, there is the development of an initial uh, project financial plan. And project financial plan is a term of art that describes a very specific document that gets built in the process of a, of a project like this. And it's a, it's a living document. Um, that evolves as funding sources become available or not available in the course of in the course of all this. Um, there were a few meetings and workshops, but very sparse. We budgeted originally for one workshop. Uh, competitive grant services, we budgeted for one grant application that we've already um, submitted. And um, a few hours for traffic and revenue advisory support. And what we're now thinking is there's a tremendous amount of support needed to get this traffic and revenue study correct. And then some advocacy support, uh, which, which are things like um, Commissioner Fox was talking about helping develop the materials that you take back to 
to Washington, D.C. and, and um, to work with your legislators, et cetera, the legislative days. So we've, we've prepared a, a proposed expanded scope in several areas, and I'm going to go into each of these areas in a little bit of detail, but one is the TIFI application support. Um, over the next uh, year, we're going to be engaging experts, uh, including your financial advisors and others, in building a uh, TIFIA application that will get submitted sometime, I'm gonna say 24 months before the money is actually needed. And that timeline is important. You, you, you don't put in an application for TIFIA until you have your entire program pretty well set up and ready to go, then you apply. And when you get your TIFIA loan approved, they want you to start spending that money within about 90 days of getting it. So it really, um, it has to be in lockstep with the progress of your, uh, of your thing. Anyway, I'll go into the details. Grant, administra uh, grant administration and reporting support. And that is for grants that you already have. We're currently working off of four grants, three of which are state grants, uh, two from Oregon, one from Washington and one from the federal government. Additional competitive grant services, which is really just additional um, grant applications as time goes on. Dramatically expanded traffic and revenue advisory and support, and I'll talk about that. Um, some expanded advocacy support, and then the Port of Hood River revenue optimization plan that I'll go into some detail on. So in terms of the TIFIA, TIFIA application, um, this really just provides um, scope and budget for consultations with the Build America Bureau, which I mentioned we're gonna start um, in the next couple of weeks, and I anticipate several meetings with them as time goes on over the, over the next couple of years. Um, consultations with the Port of Hood Rivers uh, and eventually the, the Bi-State Bridge Commission's financial advisor. And once again, financial advisor is a, is a term of art that describes a registered municipal advisor. Um, HNTB is not that, and I am not your financial advisor. Port of Hood River has a contract with uh, a firm called PFM, Public Financial Management, that is their registered financial advisor, and we will need to uh, have the services of, of that in the course of this uh, project. So the first bit of scope that we'll focus on is developing and submitting the TIFIA letter of interest. And I've detailed here, uh, and I won't go into it in, in tremendous detail, the, the contents of that letter of interest. Um, Again, I guess I kind of repeated here that we'll want to engage with your financial advisor and we'll also need to invite, uh, um, engage periodically with your bond counsel, which is another um, contract that, that you will need to have. And that is the legal counsel who helps set up um, the lending arrangements. In terms of grant administration reporting, um, this is actually, we've, we've made tremendous progress in this area and, and probably have this for the most part complete, but um, it involved development of the processes and procedures for tracking reimbursable costs and for uh, ensuring grant agreement compliance. Some of these grant agreements have a lot of, of things you have to comply with in order to be eligible to have your costs reimbursed. And then there's monthly and quarterly reporting that goes to either the states in the case of the state grants or the federal government, Federal Highway Administration. And those are usually um, forms that have to be filled out based on the cost tracking and the activities of your, um, of your project. They could be pretty detailed. We anticipate uh, perhaps not, I, my fingers are crossed, but we want to, to, to build in the possibility that we do not receive the rural or mega grant that we're still in contention for and that we may not receive the BIP, the Bridge uh, Improvement Program or Vis Bridge Investment Program grant, and that we may want to apply for those same programs and maybe others in 2023. And so we've built um, scope and budget to allow us to do that. And as always, we want to be um, always alert for additional and new grant opportunities. As you know, the, the Washington State Transportation Commission is funded to the tune of about a million and a half dollars to do a level one and level two traffic and revenue study. And the traffic and revenue study is something that um, will need to be completed and it will actually need to be an extra level, a level three or what's called an investment grade traffic and revenue study will need to be completed um, in order for us to make our TIFIA uh, application. 
And the first two stages of that are the level one and level two. And the Washington State Transportation Commission is going to pay for that. We've actually started working pretty intensively with WSTC's consultant team. Uh, this is a group called CDM Smith, and it's a group that I've worked a lot with around the country and that HNTV works with a lot and found them to be very good and easy to work with. Uh, and we have found the Transportation Commission so far to be dedicated to really helping us get a traffic and revenue study done that will support the financing needs uh, of this bridge. And so um, I think it's to the port of Hood Rivers and the new Bi-State Bridge Commission's real um, advantage to coordinate and cooperate as much as we can in this study because it's going to become our study and uh, they're paying a million and a half dollars for it. That's a million and a half dollars that we don't have to spend. Um, we've been offered and have taken uh, advantage of full membership on the Technical Advisory Committee for this study. Um, we have been liaison, and Kevin will tell you, we've been on the phone a lot with their consultant team, pulling together a lot of the initial data they need. Uh, we'll continue to monitor and ensure that the port's interests are represented through this study. Um, we'll ensure that the process is compatible with the future um, traffic and revenue needs of the port. That's one of the things that's really important. This is intended to, in some ways, inform the Washington State Legislature about the viability of this project. But at the same time, we want to make sure that our interests are, are represented and is compatible with our needs to fund this project. Uh, and then, of course, we want to use the data and the results from level one and level two to support our own um, revenue optimization plan and our own traffic and revenue study. I'll talk about that in just a second. We anticipate some need for ex expanded advocacy support, and that is, as we talked about, developing fact sheets, et cetera, lead behind materials, um, facilitating and supporting state and federal advocacy efforts, such as your trip to Washington, D.C. in December, and in-person legislative meetings, which we've already done two of. I think the latest one we did, especially both of them, I think were highly successful. The latest one we did, I think, was, a, was an absolute blockbuster, uh, and that was very worth it. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the, the revenue optimization plan. And this really is um, intended to make sure that we are developing and then implementing a toll revenue plan that goes for the next five to eight years, maybe 10 years even, that meets the funding and financing needs of this project. And that may include adjustment to toll rates as we go forward. Um, I don't want to presume that going in, um, but it really is a multi-step process. And it starts with really defining what those revenue goals are and then developing some revenue scenarios for the board to consider that will meet those goals that you've, that you've set up before. And I'll talk in a little more detail about what that is. Um, and that is developed in coordination with the, the uh, toll rate scenarios that the traffic and revenue team at Washington State Transportation Commission is doing um, to support the financing in a very formal way. And they're gonna do a really deep dive into analysis of these scenarios. Um, my recommendation is very strongly that it include a significant public and stakeholder engagement to build support, um, especially to the extent that we determine there's a need to increase tolls uh, in order to support this project. I think the public and the stakeholders need to understand what's in it for them. And I think this is, it is incumbent on us to tell our story really, really well out in the community and get the community to support um, the idea that they're going to have a stake in this and that this that increased tolls might be part of that. Um, we then want to present a detailed analysis of the most viable scenarios to the board uh, and then adopt. And I said five years here, it could be eight or 10 years, a, a revenue optimization plan and possibly new toll rates effective um, as early as July 1 of 2023. Looking at a, at a schedule to roll this out, and I will say this is a very condensed schedule. Most agencies I've worked with would take nine months to a year to do this, but I do think it can be done in the eight months that, that remain. Uh, and we wanna start with uh, in November with a mini workshop. I don't know that it needs to be a full-blown workshop, but a mini workshop with the Bi-State Working Group and, and Port of River 
Port of Hood River Board to define what are the goals? How much financing do we want to support? How much money do we want to have in reserve by the time we borrow money five years from now or seven years from now? Um, what are the parameters around a toll program that you might develop? And some thoughts there are that it, it must do certain things and it can't do certain things. And, you know, it must, for instance, we may decide that it must uh, honor past commitments that have made for toll-free passage to the, to the uh, Native American tribes. It must accommodate, uh, you know, whatever promises have been made to the community. It also must raise at least X number of dollars um, in reserves by a certain date. It must um, support X number of dollars in toll-backed financing by a certain date, et cetera. Then we would go back and we would develop scenarios that do that and come back to you in about January and refine those scenarios for your consideration. We would then take those scenarios that you approve of out to the public and let them give their thoughts on, on what they think. We would then bring back our findings and recommendations from that process and um, work with the board in March and April to develop and adopt a revenue optimization plan. Um, and then uh, if there's a toll increase included in that package, um, it'll take us several months to change signage, to reprogram the toll system, et cetera, and possibly have new toll rates in effect by July 1st, 2023. So with that, I will pause. That was a lot of information, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Kerry, uh, Sam, do you have a question? Um, I have a, a comment, which I, um, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, Kerry mentioned that um, when, when he gets when the project gets a grant uh, for whatever amount, regardless of whether it's uh, federal from the feds or from the states, uh, the expectation, or I didn't, didn't really get that, but uh, the expectation was to start spending within 90 days of getting the grant. No, that is actually for a TIFI alone. So oh, TIFI, okay. TIFI, yeah, and, and that's because interest starts to accrue. Um, you know, from your lender the day you the day you fund the loan, and so you don't okay. want to accept your TIFIA money until you're actually ready to spend it. Yeah, I misunderstood. I thought you were talking about the the uh, some grant that because it's almost impossible to do that. No, no, or, and gr yeah, grants have a long. You know right, that. Yeah. Right. Now, with that said, and most of you are probably aware of this, and you should be, um, grants do come with with expenditure. Um, what do I want to say? With timelines, they expire after a certain amount of time. And that's why you know our expenditure plan against the grants that we currently have is driven to some extent by the amount of time we have left on those different grants. Carrie, Mike Fox. Um, yes. I wanna make sure I, I heard you right. When we were in DC uh, talking about TIFI loans, the way it was explained to us is that you get your TIFIA program set up, you're pre-approved for a value. You don't start incurring, incurring uh, costs until such time as you start cashing the checks. So you only, you only pay back and you only have interest on the amount of money that you actually used. And it's, this is the first I've heard that you have to start that process 90 days after. That, that wasn't explained to us earlier. In fact, in fact, they suggested get your TIFIA loan done early, let it sit there for a year or two until you really need it, but you've got it when you need it. It's like a letter of credit. I think you I, I think you're right. Your description of a letter of credit is right. You get the approval, but you don't actually draw money until you need it. But the, my understanding is that their preference is they're not going to issue that that letter of credit until 90 days before you make your first draw, or they would prefer you not to. I, I can clarify that with them. Um, yeah, the other, that would be, I think that would be helpful if you could get that clarified. It, it is also, you said something else that's really important about TIFIA, and that is that you draw the money incrementally as you go along in the process, and you only pay interest on the money you've borrowed 
up to that point. So it really functions like a line of credit more than it does a loan. Yeah, so what I was looking for is if we got a $100 million loan, but we only use 70 million of it, you're only paying interest on 70 million based on when you actually used it. Correct. We would get approved, the, the line of credit would be for up to $100 million. Right, okay. That's my understanding. Mike, this is Kate. Um, so the, the toll discussion and how much those tolls might be that you're talking about that we would be discussing within, you know, maybe the next um, seven to nine months. Um, you know, it's like, how much do we want and how are we going to get there? A discussion between the bi-state working group or the, um, the bi-state, of eventually the bi-state authority and the port. How do we know, are we just going to pluck a number from the air? We need 70 million or how, because we won't have the study done um, by Washington State if we start that process right away. So how will we, how do you propose that? We will, we, based on the, based on the cost estimate for the bridge, we have already a, a preliminary funding plan that we've not rolled out. Um, we, we were going to roll it out actually at the legislative day and didn't, but it talks about kind of in, in, in rough categories, the amount of money we need from each of the four sources. Remember, there are federal sources, state sources in two states. There's borrowed money. Um, I forget what the fourth one was. I'm sorry, that's the four. Two states plus federal grants plus, um, plus borrowed money, which we're assuming will be mostly TIFIA because that's the best terms out there. It may actually be revenue bonds of some kind as well. Um, but you know, we will have to make some assumptions about how much money we will eventually get from the states and how much money we will eventually get from the federal government and the the last gap and it would be tolls and so we have been talking about you know 125 million to 150 million from each of the states 200 million from the federal government and that leaves 100 to 125 million um, to to be borrowed then what we do is look at what kinds of toll rates would support that level of borrowing. And then you would make a decision of how comfortable you are with, with, those, with those toll rates. And so it may be kind of an iterative process that will arrive at a number that gets us closest to what we think we're going to need in, in terms of, of toll rates that will support a certain level of, of financing. And we'll also be making assumptions, educated assumptions well-founded assumptions on interest rates and things like that. Would we get into the specificity of um, number of axles, whether we would charge for bikes or pedestrians, would we get into that kind of specificity? Yes. Okay. All right, thanks. Other questions, comments? Thank you, Karen. All right. And next we'll move into communications. Jessica. Hi, everyone. Just give me a second while I pull up my deck. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll try to make this pretty brief. Um, and just like Carrie, let me know if you have any questions as I go through this. Um, as a little bit of a reminder, our initial scope was really focused, especially for this first year, on building public awareness about what's been done so far with the um, EIS and the FEIS and what the next steps will be with design and the overall just building regional interest in the bridge replacement project. Um, we weren't planning on doing a ton of public involvement or open houses in this first year and a lot's happening. So um, that's kind of evolved. And so initially our, we were scoped to do um, a public involvement kickoff, to do a public involvement plan, develop the website, logo and project templates 
conduct some stakeholder interviews, um, do the stakeholder database and comment tracking um, that Commissioner Fox was referencing earlier, um, do some jurisdictional and community presentations. You can see it on the slide here, but it was really like high level comms um, because we knew that we were really gonna be, you know, kind of building general interest um, in this first year before we really started getting into the design process. Um, now uh, we are, are asking for additional scope and fee because we want to get a lot more done in the next eight months. Um, so our amendment request supports a few things. For one, it's going to support our ability to focus on more public involvement, ju not just pure communications, but gathering input on some of the essential decisions that um, even Carrie was just speaking to. Um, we also see a real need for more graphics and video, especially because we're going to be relying on social media um, and on um, the website in, to get the word out. Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to tell the community about what we're working on um, and communicate about just the need for this bridge replacement in ways that really pull people in and motivate them to be excited about the replacement project. And um, we also are planning to do provide more support for the bi-state working group or the bridge commission. Um, and some of that's going to include, you know, gathering input on the headquarters location, as well as some of the communications for the group. And so we know that we need a new bridge um, and just to kind of broad stroke, some of the things that we're thinking about for the amendment is that the additional resources would allow us to, as I said before, kind of capture some of those community stories. Um, and we're hoping that it will create an urgency um, with the community for the bridge replacement. Um, and, and also not just the gorge, but also in the region. We also want to just gather more input on what's needed as we begin to work on the bridge design and um, as we start to talk about this revenue optimization plan and uh, begin to build more awareness and trust with the new bridge commission because all of you have trust but I think that we can um, just help folks know that the bridge is going to be in good hands um, in the future. So what we're asking for is um, some additional time so we can do more research in our public involvement and communications plan. We realize that there's gonna be some additional new messaging that we weren't planning on preparing this first year. And we wanna make sure that we have sufficient time to work with you all to make sure that we get it right. Um, we also would like to be able to do more with communication. So I talked about this a little bit, but um, we want to expand what the website's doing, including having more tie in with the bi state working group activities. We want to create some videos, um, including a project overview video and four short videos that profiles community members, businesses, community interests. Um, but th they would be really good for social media. Um, we also have heard loud and clear that there's need for more graphics. So we've had some email communications about needing a really good project overview map that also identifies some of the stakeholders. We would like to do some infographics. Um, we realize that you know not everybody is a bridge engineer, and so we want to make sure that we're communicating the steps of this process in a really clear and digestible way. And graphics um, are really effective for people that um, don't necessarily speak English as their first language. So we're thinking about that. Um, and additional photography, which we've already kind of started to do. We've gone out once with the drone, um, with one of our drone providers. There, we see that there you know, are potentially additional opportunities for some of that work. We um, would also like to go to some more community events. So we weren't scoped to go to some of the, you know, things like Huckfest that um, are really effective ways to get the word out about this project and ask community members about um, important decision-making points. So we'd like to go to five of those. Um, we also would like to do two open houses on either side of the river, um, focus on some of these key points related to you know, the revenue optimization plan, but also, you know, like 
now that once we have a rod and a FEIS, what does that mean? And I know I, this, this group's already talked a little bit about needing some input on bike ped um, needs. So th those would be the opportunity for those open houses. Um, there were four open houses related to tolling and two online open houses since not everybody can go to in-person events. And we've learned that through the pandemic. Uh, we also just recognize that we're going to need to do uh, a higher level of tracking and comment or stakeholder and comment tracking because we'll be engaging many more people throughout this first year than we had initially planned for. And um, some additional time just to be able to meet with you all and keep you up to speed on what we're doing um, with communications and public outreach. Are there any questions or concerns about what we're asking for? Or initial yeah. thoughts? Jessica, um, I think we've, we've talked about this once or twice about the difference between PI communications and public relations. Sure. And, and I know that's been kind of like a little bit of a curiosity as we've talked, but can you talk about the difference between those two things and how is PR being dealt with in this project? So JLA is um, a public involvement firm and our area of specialty is really in public interest communications. Um, and so the where we're really going to help this project um, <clears throat> is with making sure that all of our communications and outreach speak to the broader public and our key stakeholders and bring them along with the need for the project. And um, so our area is like, we really know how to speak and engage the public. The, a public relations firm is usually really focused on getting an end result, um, which all of their messaging and all of the, everything that they do is focused on getting a specific result. Our result, of course, we want the bridge to be replaced and we're going to be able to support that. But the way we're going to support that is by bringing the public along and helping them to understand their part in supporting that the bridge to get replaced. So our communications are going to be much more about, they're going to be focused on how do we, like, what is the call to action for the public or what, what, what are the things that the public is really going to want to clue into? Like, how is this potentially going to impact them or what are the opportunities for them in the future um, with the bridge rather than, um, for example, like focusing our communications on um, like we need funding and we're, you know, like that's going to be a big piece of it, but we're not going to be like your funding specialist. We've got other people on this team that I think really know how to do that. Does that help, Kevin? Yeah, that's great, Jessica. Thank you. You bet. Jessica, do you have a slide on the cost of this? I don't have a slide on the cost of it. It, I, Last time I checked, um, with all of the things that I just included, it was about 170,000, but that includes a lot more um, resources, uh, reimbursables for media and purchasing ads on social media. So, um, I mean, it's it's a starting point. So if we need to talk about what makes the most sense or what, what you all see is the highest importance, we can do that. And we've, so they've submitted a scope and fee, Arab has that, and they're in the process of reviewing that now. So you all will get an update once Arab is uh, completed theirs, and Kevin can talk about that. I think they did it with uh, Amendment 1, but that scope uh, was given to Arab, and, and they developed an estimate, and then there was a reconciliation between the two. The exact same thing is happening with Amendment 2 right now. And then we'll get a shot at is this what we want to spend? Is this getting us what we want to get? I guess, you know, my, my thing is, is you know, we're, we're paying Jessica to come up with this. We're paying ARA, but we haven't had the discussion. Is this the right level of public involvement? Yeah. What we see before getting, like, 
when we get the amendment and it's already been through Europe and everything else, yeah. you, you're pretty far along in that path. Yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to public involvement, like I see a lot of that in Portland and High Five and the big projects. When you're in smaller communities, you get your information from a different subset. You yeah, know? and they go on the same line. Marla, have you had a chance to go through this? with Jessica in detail? I haven't gone through it with Jessica, but I think, um, sorry, Mike, I was, I was following what Jake was saying. And so my mind was kind of in that space, but uh, so I don't want to cut him off, but maybe I guess jumping the gun since you asked, I think Jake's bringing up a good point. I think what Jessica is trying to communicate is that even for example, in the last month, where we have leaned on them for some additional support that was needed and I think helped make us successful with that meeting uh, with the legislators. That's over and above what was contracted and what they walked into this partnership understanding their role to be. And so I think if we want to go back to the drawing board and think more critically about what do we think we need for the public engagement, then we have to manage our own expectations of not uh, immediately assuming it'll be something JLA can support. Having said that, I think that even just their reference earlier to communities like Lone Pine, there's a benefit to some of the experience that they are bringing having worked with other rural communities. And I do think that's a big piece of all of this is making sure that the public comes on board um, but I think that both Jake and Jessica are kind of getting to a core part of this, which is all of us getting on the same page and understanding and going in with the right expectations of when we're picking up the phone and asking for support or what we uh, are taking on on our on our own or without that additional resource that they bring to the table. That, that was what I was seeing from what um, Jessica was explaining too is when we went into that meeting on the 14th, a meeting or two before that, we as a group decided, well, we want this, we want this, we need this, please do filming here, do this. We're, you know, We put this whole list of things together, not asking, is this in your scope? Is this what you were had already, we had already contracted with you to do? We just kept throwing ideas out that were great ideas and it all turned out really good, but it was beyond the scope of, they were yeah. doing PI, we were asking them to do PR. And so, the, you know, that's why they're trying to adjust this now because we're asking for more. Well, we, we so did. I guess, to, if I can finish that off, figuring out the right amount of PI that, that we feel we need for this project this time, I think that's the whole discussion. I think, you know, asking for PR is what we're asking you to do because that's what we felt we need, right? Because you know, the, the PR side, the, we need you to do this so that we can bring these people here and we can ask for money. And, and there's a very clear line there. And the, the PI going out to the general public and trying to get the general public along with EIS. I don't, personally, I don't feel that that's something we should focus time, effort, and money on. And EIS is administrative and nobody from the public cares about that administrative process. There might be a few specific firms or nonprofits that might care about that. A couple of agencies too. And a couple of agencies, but that would still be more on the PR side than on the PI side. And so, you know, the last thing I ever want to do is have a discussion about logos or even think about that. I think the logo's just fine. We don't need to waste money on that. Uh, and we don't need to ask the public about it. And, you know, so like when I, I'm fearful that the thing that we're probably going to get hit the most at in the next year is people are going to accuse us of spending a bunch of money on stuff that the public may not think that we need to be spending money on. And that's going to hurt the odds of being and the ability to get a revenue increase in that time. And that's where I'm that's I'm really concerned, and that's what I feel the fear is based on. People feel that they pay too much already for the bridge, you know, and just based on what I see on, you know, the Facebook messages and 
comments that are around there about the new bridge. It's build the bridge already. You don't have to sell me on it. We all drive across. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I think those are, are, are good points. Um, what I would like to see is uh, more informational engagement through social media and less attempt at having um, meetings that really very few people are going to ever show up to. So, uh, so it seems to me like the schedule is. Uh, I didn't quite catch the total count of public engagement meetings, but all of those are going to get, you know, hundred people. Uh, if you're really lucky, uh, compared to uh, uh, if you can creatively engage people through you know Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, um, so that they're just going to throw you a follow because hey, there's some interesting content here that maybe I do want to just keep track of what's going on. That gives us a channel which is going to be very valuable in getting information out there. Uh, and I think the point I think you're just stressing the point that you made. We don't want to look too rich. This, that's definitely going to smell wrong to people and for good reason. I guess I would just, just to follow up on that and knowing that last meeting we had another amendment that was a significant increase. This is a drop in the bucket and this is the one part of this project where we have a team focused solely on making sure that we are out in front of potential roadblocks as this project moves forward and the things that'll trip us up in the public. And I completely agree with what both of you said, but often when these things become everyone looking for the tiniest thing to nitpick apart or to admonish in terms of spending or judgments and decisions we're making, it's because time and energy hasn't been put in to how we're connecting and messaging these things. Having said that, I agree. Now, I also have spent a long time time in my life working with a lot of logos and so I see the importance and value of logos but you're totally right that's a part of this process that does not need to go out into the public that'll irritate people that's a decision made internally let's figure it out let's get more coordinated those things are checked off JLA's time and energy with the public should be back where we were targeting it from the beginning but I do agree with Kate that in fairness it's also expanded and the amount of time that they put into helping us look good on the 14th is time that nobody else would have had. And I think we have to acknowledge if we're wanting this to go from, you know, at 100 miles an hour going forward, it's increases not just in engineering and development and funding analysis. It's, I think the investment in public information can't be devalued. And I also would say is, is not knowing how Arab's looking at it, but Again, 170,000 is one of the, lo the lower numbers we've seen of late in terms of asking for increased spending. Marla, um, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really trying to understand what you just said. Um, do you think that the uh, meetings that are scheduled are the way that we're going to get in front of potential problems with the public? Or do you think that there are other, other ways of, getting discussion to happen in the public so that we can, uh, so that we'll have the ability to, to sense and anticipate those problems? Um, well, if you're talking about the meetings that I think are on our calendars these next two weeks, to me, I see those as kind of this launch and kickoff that needs to get going and should be those meetings and potentially that's it. Because the real focus on meetings in my mind, I think what you're getting at is how are we engaging the public? And I actually agree right. with what you said. I think more of that's gonna be about social media, the creation of these videos, little snippets that are easy to understand and to translate into the context of what people are really caring about so that that stuff is at the ready for us. So when the news hits the front page of Columbia Gorge News that the port's considering or the bi-state working group's considering an increase in tolls, the same day that that's hitting the paper, we've got highly polished videos and an infographic, an explainer of why this is getting raised now, where your money is going to go. And maybe there's been some true traditional in-person meetings too, but I, I do agree that that's going to be less of it because of the way that our communities interact now. Um, but I also would say that's where JLA's experience comes into the arena. You know, they, they can advise us on what's been working in these recent years of shifts in how people are participating. But I do think all of us have seen in our own governments that, you know, simply holding a public hearing is, is not going to be where you get most of it. And it can't be, you know, treated like you check it off the list and it's done. Yeah, I mean, that's why I kind of, I, I imagine that uh, we're going to have these um, uh, 
by the time we're talking about, in the public about raising tolls, I would hope that we have a good community of followers to our social media. So we'll instantly yeah. be able to see the chatter that's going on and see if people are understanding it or not. And if they're not, we'll be able to take action. That, that's what I thought you were saying. It yeah. Sounds like yeah. Anymore. Okay, great. Totally. Yeah. I agree with you. So, and I'll just uh, add that a, a, a I don't think that, I, that, oh, sorry. Just a question that I've got. Kind of my expectations is I was hoping that your, your group could help us actually write the approach, write the, uh, the articles that says, here's why we need a bridge toll increase. Here's the reasoning behind it. Crafting the message that goes out on social media and so on. So it's, it's more than just the, the vehicle. It's writing the message in such a way that, you know, pro projects what we're trying to do here. And, yeah. and can you do that, or do we need another group to do that? Is that PI or PO? Yeah. That's, it's public involvement, um, and we can certainly do that. We were, I was imagining that in preparation for, you know, some of the stuff that Carrie was presenting that um, would get a public input on the revenue optimization plan that we would be creating graphics and videos and um, communicate just general communications about like why a tolling increase is needed. I personally think that's a big effort that's facing us. And if we don't get it right, we're gonna stub our toe. I completely agree. And that's a, that, I mean, Initially, we didn't necessarily want to do a lot of in-person public open houses, but we know that that is something that we do need to get right, which is why we did have the four open houses specifically for that conversation, because there's like, there's just frankly some relationship building and some conversations that need to happen face to face. And that's what those opportunities offer. So I, I'm thinking that the, you know, these kickoff meetings might be the main thing that's needed and then more of the infographics and information social media things as we go forward i'm just personally the wording revenue optimization <laughs> that's that is deadly that is totally not yeah, I, totally reacted to that also. I am yeah. like oh my god what yeah, people yeah. say is things. you are trying to raise this as high as you can yeah that, you know, that in itself, it's like, no. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally, I was just using that because that <laughs> is how we've been referencing it in today's meeting. But yeah, like a big piece of the work that we do is making sure that the way we're communicating about stuff um, is first of all, like understandable and also just like, is something that the public's going to respond well to. Um, yeah, I think that so, the yeah. revenue is the main thing the public wants to know about. Yeah. I don't, you don't have to convince them about EISs or whether we need no, it. I, none of that. All yeah. they care about is how much it's going to cost them to go across that bridge now and later. Mm -hmm. And so I think the main focus for the public is, has to do with the tolls. And then the PR is totally different, um, different audience, you know, different, different things. But I guess the question is, how do you bring people into this discussion? And that's, so I'm assuming what Jessica is describing is that, uh, that she's going to be preparing some materials that are going to be interesting enough that they'll, that when people see them in their Facebook feed, uh, they may share them. I say, well, that's an interesting graphic. I'm going to share that with my friends. And then you start yeah. to develop the community, which you can then monitor and, 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 and communicate to. And, you know, when you say we're going to start these meetings, Carrie's talking about starting these meetings about revenue optimization, which we should change the name of. But um, if we had the right information going out to people, I would love it if we got 20 people to come to those meetings, because then they could see us talking about we're not trying to just raise this sky high. Right. We're trying to keep it as low as we can and still have enough money to pay for a new bridge. <laughs> and they can help us get that message out versus we all get in a room, we all have a meeting, we all make a decision and well, they've already hit the gavel and it's all done. Nobody knew about it. So, I mean, that that's what I would rather have happen. 
uh, you know, we, we went through this with the county with putting a parking system, uh, parking fee in place in Post Canyon. Yeah. And we had uh, we did a lot of homework on it beforehand. And so that and then monitor all the social uh, media. And as it was happening, when there was things were starting to twist a little way, I would sort of jump in and push things just a little bit. At the end, we had 90% positive comments about it, if not 95%. But if you hadn't been yeah. there to bend that, you have to, you, it would, it could have just gone it was an completely existing off the social rail. media community, which doesn't, which we don't have, which we don't have right now. So no. I, I want to see that we get that community now so that when we need it, we know sure. we're monitoring real people. Yeah. I'd like to see the proposal. <laughs> That's where I am. <laughs> so what what do we want to do? I want to see the logo. <laughs> <laughs> we've got this, I mean, we've got this school fisher box. Mm -hmm. We got the uh, project there. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. What what direction do we want to give Jessica? Do we want to modify it? Do we want to Maybe. reduce the number of public meetings? Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing to, to offer out is this is time and material contract. They will only do what we ask them to do. You all ask them to do. Um, so it, and you can reduce it wherever you want to do. It, if you give them the flexibility, then they can react much quicker than having to say, well, we don't have the budget for that. We got to go back to a meeting, get permission and do all that. Some of that we should keep in mind. Um, but I think we control that by making sure that they're only doing what they're being asked to do, and we are very clear in what they're what well, they're working on. That's so. what it comes down to: is to be clear what we're, what we're yeah. trying to say is, is we need to focus on the revenue side because that's going to be the thing that we're going to have to clearly link. You know, every every dollar we get is going to go towards a new bridge. It's going to go towards you know being able to bring more grant dollars to keep your total revenue low. Right. And that's just got to be everything that's that's pushed out there and put forward, um, and and kind of maybe the, the rest of the public involvement on: Do we need a new bridge? Do we need community stories about what what would happen if we don't have a new bridge? I I think everybody I, I, there's not a single person I know that doesn't say we need a new bridge. Yeah. Every person that I know though says I'll be dead before I see a new bridge. And if that's their personality and how they feel about it, asking them to pay for the new bridge when they don't feel that it's a possibility, that's your love. And that's what you have to get over. Yep. Well said. Yeah. I'm okay with leaving it up to uh, Jessica on how many we need. I think she's heard our concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and is a professional and would be able to figure that out. I, I don't want to micromanage it. I think yeah, us having our our opinion to her that what we're concerned about is enough. I, I think we've had a good discussion today. Let her go back and think about it and uh, and then come back with the with a clear recommendation. And what I would say too is that we we are going to be very transparent in what we're doing. Yeah. So if at any point you're like, why are you doing that? You, I mean, if we meet every two weeks, we should not progress any more than two weeks before you say, whoa, that's not where we wanted to go. So there will not be any period of time where we're like working for four or five months before you know what we're doing. Um, so that's also, you know, going to be very beneficial to you all to have that. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to make a motion or a suggestion that Jessica... You know, you've heard our concerns. I don't know whether you need to modify your scope document today. And you've got an estimate in there for right now. That gives you about $150,000 to spend, no. if I remember yeah. right, out, out of the estimate, yeah. assuming that AREP agrees with it. That $150,000 is about one person, one equivalent person mm -hmm. per year. Uh, after you load it up. So my gut feel, knowing that your contract is time and material and you're going to do what we ask you to do, I would probably recommend it. Leave it alone and, and we'll keep going and we'll just be careful what we ask you to do. And and we want you to, to ask us, are you sure that's what you want to do? Just to keep this on the line. I appreciate that. 
And can't do. Are you okay with that? Yep. Okay, sounds fair. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I got a nod from Bob. Marla, you're okay? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mayor, thank you. All right, Mayor's let's go to the Benjamin last one. Catherine's on there, too. Catherine, can you? I'm sorry. I don't think she can. Oh, can oh, she, she not? She says she's driving. Yeah, she's okay. Driving. All right. I'm right back now, and I, yes, oh. that's fine. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. All let's right. Go to the next one. Herb. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. We want to do, you, can you pull up your presentation? Uh, give me a minute here. <laughs> Hang on. If not, I can pull it up and walk. Yeah, why don't you pull it up? I just okay. got back in town. So, okay. I have it pulled up here. Hi, right, good afternoon, everybody. Herb Fricky with Akana. And we're putting together the approach for developing the tribal MOAs. Um, why don't we go ahead to the next? Um, so our current scope of work was to really just assist the port in coordinating efforts with the uh, Four treaty tribes, as well as the other tribes that have been consulted. Um, originally, uh, we were developing a tribal coordination plan, which we have done, and it's draft and uh, close to finalizing. Um, again, assisting with finding tribal contacts and assisting the port with arranging meetings, um, reviewing any of the tribal MOAs, uh, assisting on identifying impacts from the new construction, and advising on an approach to engage the tribes about sensitive issues and potential mitigation solutions. Uh, really, it was just more of an advisement um, scope of work. Uh, we also are developing a cultural training um, program, uh, which we'll uh, do um, after Thanksgiving. So we're, we're actually in the process of developing that right now, right now and it's really geared around Providing um, some historical background on the, the four treaty tribes and some of the differences between the tribes and, and also the commonalities um, and, uh, and how their governments are organized, which is really critical in developing MOAs and negotiating with the tribes. Uh, next. So, what we've been tasked to do now is actually develop those MOAs. Um, so we'll continue uh, with the cultural training. Uh, oh, this is the other assistance. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, yeah, the amended yeah. scope is now really just dealing with the four treaty tribes themselves, the Yakima Nation, Warm Springs Tribe, Umatilla Tribe, and uh, the Nez Perce Tribe. Um, the three, which would be, um, Cowlitz, Grand Ron, and Silettes. Um, they're going to be handled through Section 106 process, which is being led by WSP. Hang on a sec. Sorry about that. I was hunting down near Chilliquin. We got. <laughs> We were striking out big time, and so we stayed an extra day, but we still didn't see anything. So we came back empty-handed and, and just got back today, <laughs> going for help down there. <laughs> I think climate change, it's just, they're, they've just disappeared. It's just weird. I didn't see anything. Anyway, um, so we'll continue developing the tribal coordination plan. Um, again, that's um, just about final. Uh, but the new scope would be to arrange and attend meetings with each tribe. Um, also continue coordinating with Federal Highway and ODOT in terms of all communication and logging, um, keep a log of our contacts and communication. 
uh, providing updates to uh, Fort Hood River and the Bi-State Working Group. And as I mentioned, we would actually develop those tribal treaty MOAs. So we'll work with uh, the draft that has been started with Yakima Nation. That'll be a starting point for all the drafts. Um, and we've actually connected with um, the Matilla tribes recently, just last week, starting that conversation. Um, continue to assist on identifying impacts from the new bridge construction. Um, what we're going to do is actually develop a map and start locating where those impacts are, which will help you know, as in developing um, what we're calling the construction zone. Um, there was some terminology used with exclusion zone, but we're changing that to construction zone um, because we felt that that was a little bit too negative to be approaching the tribes with. It still says that right here, exclusion zone, what we're going with construction zone. And um, so we'll work to develop a mitigation strategy, deal with the fishing impacts. Um, including developing financial payment or any damages that um, may be identified and also wrap that into the construction zone as a way to um, identify more of a broad area, probably easier to enforce and maintain. Um, also, uh, would be easier to work with the tribes in terms of um, coordinating with them during their fishing seasons. Um, there also are, most people know, there are some net anchorage sites on the existing bridge, uh, which will be lost. Uh, so we'll work with the tribes on identifying um, ways to replace those or if they need to be replaced. Uh, we'll work with the port on any methodology for quantifying economic impacts due to lost fishing time. Um, again, this will be wrapped into the construction zone concept and then make any other recommendations. I'm sure we'll, um, there will be some items that come up and either needing some legal review or some economist um, consultation on, on some of the values that we come up with. Um, again, we'll continue with the cultural training, providing that um, to you and the uh, uh, the H and the owner's rep team. Also, some items that we thought would be good to include would be, would be assisting with coordination of potential Native American elements or motifs that could be incorporated into the bridge design. Um, I understand there's also a committee that's being formed and uh, we could help with that committee, the aesthetics committee. Um, continue to advise on how to approach tribes about potentially sensitive issues, and we can help uh, with the monitoring plan that will be developed as well um, through the Section 106 process. I think that's okay. it, right, Mike? Yep. So, so the way I, I read this, and I've seen this before, is that in the past, uh, our other contractor, WSP, was kind of involved in this, and and we're pushing more of the, the real direct work onto HNTV because of their expertise here, with the hope that we can push forward on progress on this whole thing. Um, but they're keeping those section 106. Yeah, they're keeping 106, and hopefully that gets done quickly, and then and they kind of go away. Right, and, it, uh, and this way they, we separate the two issues entirely. That, it helps to separate it into the, in the washed out FHW tribes perspectives if you have it separated too, because now they can focus on this as a 106 issue, this is a treaty tribe issue, and they are separate because one's a cult, more cultural resources issue, one's more of a mitigation of a treaty right, so there's, it. Yeah, it just so, sort of was understanding, but don't the treaty tribes also have 
the cultural issues? Yes. Yes, they do. So they're involved in the 106 process also, Herb, is that correct? Yeah. That's correct. correct. Okay, yeah. so this is in addition. Uh, so everyone's involved in, the, all, all the tribal nations are involved in the 106 part of it, and then just the treaty tribes are involved. In, yeah, okay. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the treaty each... tribes don't have any treaty fishing rights on the Columbia. Yeah, and they will each be unique uh, in our conversations with you, Matilda. They were very clear to say, it's great you're starting with something from Yakima Nation, but this is not Yakima Nation, and we will negotiate ours yep. independently of of that. So another reason for separating it from WSP is that if federal highways at some point allows for them to be decoupled again, WS can WSP can finish up the final EIS and the treaty MOAs continue on. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Do we have a list of who all fishes in that construction zone? That was part of what Herb was talking about. We want to create maps from each tribe of specifically what they have in the area because they are each different. Right. Um, and we want to make sure we can have that going into the negotiations to say, you know, you got five spots, 10 spots, whatever it is, and be able to map those and have that. And it I comes from the tribes. Really instrumental in setting the construction zones. Yes. We've yep. received it for the warm springs. Uh, it's been a little tougher to receive from the Yakima. So forgive my ignorance, but do these uh, areas overlap? Not, no, they really don't, but they always could. I mean, the, each tribe has their own treaty right, right? And that's what they coordinate through CRITFIC, uh, Columbia River Reader Tribal Fish Commission. Yep. But in the end, each tribe does set their own fishing season and um, coordinates with their own fishers as to where they're fishing. But aren't most places hereditary and have been in that family for a very long time? And yes. Could not have a map of who fishes where and the names? We have one for Warm Springs on the Oregon side. You would think that because they put out the permits every year. We're hoping that we'll be able to get that. Okay. Other questions? I have a question. So the cultural training and that training is for who is that for? To for the H and T B team, uh, Port of Hood River staff, and and BSWG members. And we think we'll do it in a two part. Uh, one part with the H and T B team, and then a second part with uh, with BSWG in the port. So is that just um, to give them a history yeah. of the negotiations? It's really to help establish a, a historical context you know, around what the treaty rights are, but also what the tribes are um, in terms of their cultural commonalities and their cultural differences. Well, it also helps us understand when we're communicating with them that we don't say right. something stupid. Okay. Yeah, I didn't want. To say okay, I get it. Okay. You know, so and to help you understand that during negotiations, things may go differently with each tribe, and a lot of that will have to do with how their government is set up and who they're um, delegating authority to, and then what the ultimate approval will be. Whether by council yeah, so, or okay. chairman. So I understand that there's a fair amount of turmoil in the Yakima uh, Nation right now. Is yeah. that going to affect our schedule? We don't know. Uh, no. Yeah, that, Herb, I don't know if you want to give a two two minute update on that. Like they changed out their whole committee Correct. basically. So uh, the tribal council, there were four that members, I believe, that were kicked off the council as well as the chairman and um, vice chairman, I believe. We we have not, I guess, Curb, we really don't know exactly what impact that's going to have yet on how quickly no, they'll organize. And... Yeah, because they'll have to um, establish a new government under the new chairman. Right. And um, that'll take some time. Well, I guess what I'm asking, so you're, you're still, you, you, you have a set of meetings which are underway, so that sounds like at lower levels, the, the government continues to function. 
Is that is that fair? It does, but there are always uh, political appointments um, below the the chairman and council, and those, and that could be the you know cultural uh, committee chair or something. You don't, you just never know. Um, yep. Like with every government, there's always some people that come in and go. Uh, yeah. Great. So okay. let us know. Let us know if you do. Uh, if you do get any insight, let us know. Thank you, Herb. Do. Good. All right, and let's move on real quick to upcoming. I'm going to stop sharing so people don't have to look at the screen. So upcoming actions, we're working with ODOT on their technical service agreement, which is an intergovernment agency agreement that are just reimbursing ODOT for their time on the project. So um, we'll be working through that. Amendment two is uh, scheduled right now for the December meeting, um, right? This is what the schedule was. Amendment two with ODOT. I'm sorry. Or is it a subject? Uh, amendment, the one we were just going through the presentations on, sorry. We'll um, give you an update on how we're going to clear up November 14th meeting on the 14th but the actual amendment final amendment will come to you until that December meeting. I guess I'm still trying to digest why we're paying ODOT for consulting for us to well, the project yes. patient be doing. So that's been going I'm on. Just trying to check if I'm saying that's this. Going back <laughs> to the and uh, yeah you know a lot of times uh, when you get this that was from House Bill 2017 Five million from there. Okay. A lot of times you'll get uh, state grants, as you know, that will have like an administrative sure. percentage. That grant did not have that administrative percentage takeaway. Instead, they just billed us for their time, which worked out to about seven to eight percent of that five million. I don't think that was their intent, but when I took their number and divided it by the five million, it was about seven and a half. Percent. Sounds like a protection racket to me. Well, well, we'll let uh, we'll let you uh, let you determine. <laughs> I can write in a call. <laughs> I, I know I am. I, I believe me, I know that. <laughs> All right. Um, the project delivery method is moving forward. You may have heard or seen a questionnaire that went out uh, on Friday uh, to industry just to get some feedback. Um, we've got a workshop planned for the seventh. Uh, industry workshop that will be virtual uh, and that'll be followed up with some one-on-ones and then the final presentation on delivery method will be in December. Um, there was also uh, a release of a program by USDOT. Uh, they're doing some training in December, which is um, they're developing something to help uh, agencies also do kind of what we're doing now, which is determining the delivery method. So um, they're just getting ready to release that and, and we'll attend that training on December 6th. So uh, just kind of goes to reinforce the need to have a process when you determine the delivery method of a project. So, um, and then we've got the CFA approvals that uh, we're hoping to get to in January of this year. That was all the upcoming actions. Before we open it up, I, I've got a request for you guys for next month. Or I, I'm feeling a little goosey that I don't know where we stand against the, the grants. How much have we spent? And it's not just HMTV, it's everybody else that's been at the trough. Yep. Uh, so I would really appreciate if somebody could get a picture for us. Where do we stand, not only on spending the committee, if we, we just we can did, do uh, Amendment 1, yep. how much do we have left? We're getting ready to do Amendment 2. How much is it going to take, um, et cetera? The second piece of that is, what is it going to take for us to tap into the $75 million from the state of Washington? Um, so, if I could, I don't know how many of you know Michael Williams. He's the, uh, what's, what's your title? I'm, I'm really the local programs engineer for the Southwest region, but I was assigned this project back in 2017. Yeah, well, how about uh, when I was the planning manager, so. Uh, cool. Well, welcome. Yeah, I, I tried to make some of the events, but, uh, you know, with COVID and all, this is the first time I've been back in, in three years, so. Wow. Well, Michael's been great. He's been uh, our liaison on the 75 million. Okay. So, uh, 
you helped, I think, or maybe you worked with Steve Siegel a little bit on some of the initial uh, tracking of how that 75 would be spent. But it sounds like you might have some. So I, I was, uh, Kevin asked me this question a month ago, and I've been trying to track this down, but where, where the 75 million is. And um, I, I'm sorry, I have a piece of paper out in the car. I forgot to bring it in. But um, basically, the 75 million is just a placeholder. There is no actual 75 million yet. It's a placeholder um, to be determined. And uh, let me grab my glasses here. Anyway, so 75 million, um, it's undefined and it'll be determined later. So it's a placeholder out there for construction. So it's even more important that we get this commitment ledger thing going so we know we have a picture of when are we gonna run out of funds. Yeah, one of the important parts of that too is all of the grants have timing associated with them and when they have to be obligated and when they have to be expended by. So we'll need to, we'll walk through that also. All right. Mike, can you just touch on what is your, uh, what are you hearing as far as when that 75 million for construction would be available or not available? Well, so right now, again, it's a placeholder in the, the move uh, ahead of Washington account. Um, what was just transpired to me this morning was that placeholder puts it out to 2031-33. Now that's that's the tail end of the moving uh, move ahead Washington account. And but between now and then, it's a placeholder sitting there. So when you guys are ready, you're going to construction, then I'd start knocking on doors. So uh let me clarify construction. Does that mean design construction? Your design build. Yes. So that you know that would trigger something if you're yes. you know, if your design is six months ahead of construction and you're going out to construction and they're designing it six months ahead, you know, that's considered design build construction. But in a in a true design build, you're what I'm used to is that you hire a, an outfit like Bechtel that does design build. Right. It's usually fast track, right? Where you get builders with the designers to make sure that what you're designing is constructible and it optimizes the construction sequence and, and efforts and so on. So even though it may take a little bit on the design piece of it, you've got construction involved in it. It just happens to be a relatively small percentage of true construction, right. a really important piece of construction. Absolutely. Um, so my gut feel is that we do this preliminary design work, the latter part of 23, we're going to be looking for a, a design builder. That program to start with, with maybe the effort starting late, fiscal year 23 or early 24 with the hope that we could get going in the river in 25. So that would mean that we would need to access that money late, late 20, well, which we've got to have notice that we can do it before we make an award, which would be latter part of 23. So it's it's part of that move ahead Washington account. And is it true that I mean, is there money in that account currently? Or do you have to start feeding that account with the increase in that comes in, in January on the sales or on the yeah, fuel tax, gas tax revenue? I, I, I guess I don't understand your question. Um, so understand that the legislature, you know, in the legislative session will then be discussing about funds for the next series, which would like if they're discussing funds for this next legislative session, when they approve the trend the supplemental transportation package, that doesn't kick in until July 1st when that those funds become available. Um 23. But it would be July 23 if the conversation is being had um, during the 23 legislation. So it couldn't, it couldn't be any earlier than July of 23. Right. And then that biennium goes from 23 to 25. Yes. And then the next biennium is from, it's a two year biennium cycle for Washington. So what you're telling so, me is imperative that we 
get the ore in the water the first part of 23 to make sure that when that thing comes out in July, we've got money in for it for the back end of July 24, or back end of 23, 24, 25. So basically, um, but again, this is undefined. It's just undefined. It's just right. that, hey, here's 75 million someday. And it's actually been identified as Fed dollars too. And the legislature, though, this spring or this session can define when that 75 million will actually get funded, right? So it's up to the legislature, this, to the legislature. right? Because typically they do that when they, under a norm, typical, they would have done that aging when they did the move ahead Washington package. This right. time they did not do that. They right. just said, that, that, we're going right. to do a bunch of money, but they never said when the money was coming. Right. So, so it's this package, package. Yeah. it's yeah. this in some right. But then they set, you know, revenues to, to fund those projects. And I'm not certain if those revenues go in straight right. into that fund to fund that, or if they go to the general, and then the general has to then fund that program. I Washington State, it's a gas tax funding. So, so it's, it's not going to the general fund. So, so, so then the money from the gas tax when it starts getting in 20, when it's January 23. If, if it's if it's state funds, but this has been identified as unde, undefined Fed funds. Hmm. So I'm I'm not. You're not sure. Oh, well, yeah. the the challenge is going to get even more interesting because Senator King is kind of committed that he's trying to up that number this next session. So we've got to we've got to stay right in there to make sure it's not only identified but funded. We should talk to him about yeah. uh, clarify what I'm what's going on. Yeah. Uh, so just let me add to that list is is uh is I, I I'm not sure if you have to answer right now, but uh, in Oregon there's a revenue forecast pro uh, process which happens quarterly and annually, uh, are the size of these pots of money affected by this? Is our fuel tax monies or these federal monies, are they uh, are they estimated through this uh, revenue est this revenue estimation process uh, or not? I wouldn't have an answer to that. I'm, I'm just getting the question out there. So, uh, <laughs> so Jake can ask uh, Senator King's office. Well, Mike, Mike, correct? Right? Yes. Okay, so we got three mics now. That's good. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming. And anytime yep. you want to join us, you're more than welcome to. Well, I, you know, I do. I do the. Yeah, we've seen you there. Yeah, yeah. I'm just a little confused. I'm saying your most important project is this one. <laughs> That's what I've heard. Mike's been great. He's, he's been here since uh, the House Bill 2017 money in 2017. So, uh, I know what we were doing a year ago. You know what we were doing a year ago? Trying to get the five million. That's so true. <laughs> yes. No, you've been great. Uh, all your work on the IGAs with uh, the state and the right. board. Uh, really appreciate everything you've done, Mike. And, and you're you got something else to kind of announce too. Well, I wasn't going to announce that. Yeah. Yet. So I'm I'm leaving the agency on uh, January 31st. So. <laughs> so where are you going? Um, I'm retiring. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna trust you that. <laughs> Hopefully, it works better for you than it did for me. <laughs> Stay off the boards, Mike. <laughs> really, I was just trying to get a new joy. Yeah, yeah right. Hey, the, you the, don't uh, have to live in the county if we don't have room there. No. When are our next okay. meeting? Are we kind of done with this? Let's see when our next meeting is. Yeah, so our next meeting is the 14th. Okay. And then not again and then until the 12th of December. Okay. And do we have one more? Uh, do we have another legislative? We have one more on the ninth. On the ninth. And that's the last one until everything gets figured out. And then we'll probably do some additional ones after that. Okay. Is it, um, could you possibly do the one on the ninth, Arthur? Um, I don't think I'm going to be in town. So I, I, I was affected by, um, wait, who's, who's it going to do you want to close out the meeting? Sure. Yeah. Wanna... I just need to see if I can find. Okay. Yeah, is, I suggested uh, I gave her a couple of names to try. Is Bob still on? Oh, Bob. Yeah, yeah. it's Bob. 
Bob, are you going to be around on uh, the 9th of November? Let me check. At one o'clock in the afternoon. I should be. I've got too many calendars. Let's see. <laughs> I believe I will be, although I've, I've got a uh, uh, some sort of a fundraiser that week. I just don't know what it is. It's not in town, so I've got to check. But uh, I can try to make that happen. Okay, it'll be at one, and it's just about a half an hour usually. And I could get uh, Mike or Katie to send you the information of yeah. what I've been doing. It's just a paragraph. I should be fine. Yeah. The okay, 12th. Great. The 12th is when I, it's that weekend of that week. So yep, ninth should be fine. Okay. Great. Mike, Shannon, could you get that to Katie or send that on to Bob? Katie. Thanks, Bob, for doing that. Mm -hmm. No problem. Glad okay. I got something. Well, let's do a quick round robin. Bob, anything you want to bring up? Nope, not at this time, other than uh we've uh Arthur and I had have had a few conversations. Um my time is becoming more limited as I kind of transition away from the county back into uh, more of the business world, I guess. And so it's likely Arthur will probably take over and our positions may swap before the end of the year um, as far as primary um, uh, person and alternate on the on the uh, vice state working group. But uh, not hasn't happened yet officially, but that's going to probably happen in the next month or two. Well, we're going to miss you. And, and the good news is you got a good backup with, with Arthur. So uh, we're real fortunate there, but um, more in the future. Yeah, uh, that's all I got. Mayor Kiewit, anything you want to say? Um, I don't really have anything. Um, I don't know if when I was out, if um, Kevin Greenwood mentioned that we um are working on collaborating on a grant that would uh, a washington state department of transportation grant that could possibly fund bike ped access um and connect in with the bridge um project so it's still it's called a connecting communities grant and there's some funding that just got released and so we're trying to figure out if we're eligible for that or not well good thank you yeah uh, it looks like uh, Mayor McBride. Mayor, Mayor McBride. No, I just wanted to uh, confirm the next appointments or the next meetings, and and I couldn't. I'm going to be gone during the night, so okay. that's all that. Um, not much. I had a good discussion with uh, uh, Kevin and Mike uh, and, uh, and and another person about the uh, bike path aspects and some things that we need to get ahead of before we go too far, too much farther. Uh, so. Uh, that's hopefully coming down the road pretty quick. Sir, I think I set it up today. Okay, how about any from you guys? Then we are at four o'clock. Uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn. 20 seconds. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.